This episode of That Mental Ginger Show is brought to you by the Thomas the Tank Engine Man documentary. Watch Nick Jones's amazing BBC documentary which was first aired in 1995 about the Reverend Wilbert Audrey and the Thomas the Tank Engine series. The documentary is out on limited release and copies are selling out quickly. I should know, I just got one myself. To purchase a DVD, Blu-ray or on-demand copy, please go to www.quantafilms, that's Q-U-A-N-T-A films, all one word, dot co dot uk. There are also two charming mugs quoting the Reverend W. Audrey himself. However, these are very limited, so they will sell out fast. Thank you to Quanta Films and Nick Jones in particular for being our very first sponsor. I really do appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the show. All right, trip. <laughs> Nicholas, it is an absolute pleasure and a privilege to get to talk to you today. How are you, my friend? Well, um, it's going to sound like an old wreck, but I'm recovering from shingles. I didn't even know what it was until I had it, and uh, I learned pretty quickly. Apparently, when I was a child, I used to get chicken pox all the time. They never yeah. quite goes, and... Um, well, it came back again and it felt like I, I had creatures eating across my stomach late at night oh. and um, I, uh, I got a bit of treatment and then I made the mistake of going to the A&E at my old college hospital in London and uh, I wasted a whole day there and in the end the nurse volunteer said best you go home we can't help you so um, I just wow. had to wait and be patient but it has held me up a bit um, it's just a bit concerning um, the, the way things are run in A and E. This was uh, King's College Hospital in London, and uh, used to be quite grand when I was a student there, but um, mm. not so efficient now. But uh, I've largely recovered, and um, all I say is what I thought would take ten days took about eight weeks. But wow. it wasn't known. I'm um, blasting on. I've just uh, started one project about German shepherds why I love my German Shepherd, and I am <clears throat> having a final blast at what's called British Aviation Genius, my films about Frank Whittle and Eric Brown, the inventor of the jet engine, and the very famous Scotsman Eric Brown, who is reckoned to have been the greatest pilot ever. I knew both men quite well, particularly Eric. And mm. thirdly, I have got back into um, the world of what I like to call the railway series. I know that generically it is known as Thomas, but as a child, many, many decades ago, it was called the railway series by the rev dot w dot v dot audrey. People always had full stops in those days. Yes. Quite not happy with them. But uh, like, like some cricket scorecards and that sort of thing. So um, it, I'm really involved at the moment in the, the story of the railway series from its uh, possible incubation back in, I would guess, in the 1920s in a little village in Wiltshire near Box Tunnel, right through to today. And the fact that, in my view, we are in the 80th anniversary of Thomas at some point this winter coming. Mm -hmm. Opinion seems to be divided as to when the first story was read to Christopher or created. It wasn't read, of course, it was created by Wool for his son. Mm -hmm. I think it's that winter of 42 to 43 in a, a Birmingham suburb, in the height of all. It sounds pretty gloomy, actually. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I, I don't know if, do you know a fan, Tom Jedski, who, who's very yes, involved. Sir. Tom really has been instrumental in getting me back into, um, <clears throat> into all this. He filmed me for his own forthcoming documentary called Behind the Steam. And uh, then Brannon came along, Brannon Carty, and filmed me for his. I mm -hmm. went up to uh, uh, Tanith Lynn initially and sat in Wilbert's study, which was quite extraordinary, because the last time I was in, uh, well, not quite the same room, but all the elements that, <coughs> excuse me, make up the study, was back in 1994 at, at Sodor, no less. But uh, the reason I mentioned all this is that many years ago, back in the 80s, I was fascinated by taking photographs to capture the, what I call the end of the old railway scene. It wasn't so much blue diesels, although they were on the way out, but it, it was a world where a lot of the railways still had um, 
express trains with buffet cars, signal boxes, gloomy old stations, and um, express diesel express hauled locomotives. And uh, I realise now, almost well, between 35 and 40 years on, my photographs have got quite a novelty value. Uh, not just because I took the wider scene rather than close-ups of the engine, but I managed to capture a great deal of um, the tail end of a railway scene that went back to before the turn of the last century. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn those into a book as well. I've uh, started scanning the pictures and I'm not quite sure what to call it. it, it it's, I, I thought the last days of Diesel, like the last days of Disco, that film a few years ago. Yeah. But um, I think it's something which, I've got some notes to my left here, something which takes into account, it's the, the end of blue, the end of semaphore signals, and the end of a way of life on the railways. It, it's a personal journey, just going around the railway scene in the first half of the 1980s. One thing I never did was actually write down what the train was. And obviously I could see if it was a peak or something like that, but I never wrote down, this is the 1006 from St Pancras to Derby. But um, I've got a fairly good memory and I can remember a little storyline that goes with most of the pictures. So not only am I, remaking the Thomas the Tank Engine in superior form in a very limited mm -hmm. edition with um, you know, remastered material starting with Warwood interview. I'm making bonus features for it. We filmed Mike O'Donnell, which we can talk about in a minute if you like. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to bring this book out. So I, I want to offer a kind of limited edition, but fairly attractive, if I say so myself, mm -hmm. railway package with a nice documentary, um, mm -hmm. bonus features made today. Mm -hmm. with my own insight looking back on the whole Thomas phenomenon since 1994, a long time ago, and mm -hmm. thirdly, a book with lots of lovely photographs. Oh, definitely. Well, you've already got my pre-order for the Thomas the Tank Engine Man documentary. I was I was on that like a rash the second I heard about it, but um, I will definitely be pre-ordering your book once it's once it's ready. Please keep that me informed. That will be up on the website pretty soon, actually. Yeah. I, um, in fact, I know, I now, what I might do, did you follow me on Twitter? Uh, I can follow you on Twitter. Well, I will I we'll, we'll actually I use, we'll use this for the plug. I always do like to do a plug for uh, my audience to find everybody. So, so Sal, where can my audience find you? Because uh, I found you okay, and right, it's been start. such a delight. Um, <clears throat> you can find me all over the place. One at quantafilms.co.uk. That's Q-U-A-N-T-A. F for Foxtrot, I L O, start again, F I L M S dot co dot UK or dot com. That's quantafilms dot co dot UK or dot com. It's got to contact me, it's got my email there, even got my telephone. So um, there's nowhere for me to hide. I can always be reached that way. I also am on Twitter on at Whittle Statue. Now, what on earth is that about? Whittle is W H I T T L E, statue, as in statue, S T A T U E. It's mainly used for talking to the Thomas fandom community, but um, Whittle is, of course, Frank Whittle, Sir Frank Whittle, the inventor of the jet engine. And um, I also have a, what's left of what was originally quite a large run of DVDs of a film I made called Whittle, the Jet Pioneer. In 1997, on March the 20th, I had a very nice documentary go out called Genius of the Jet on BBC Two's Horizon. Mm. And um, I didn't know the editor of Horizon, but uh, <clears throat> what persuaded him to run with the idea was I had shown him from uh, the BBC archive, my previous BBC film, which of course was the Thomas the Tank Engine Man. And I remember him sort of giggling as he spoke on the telephone. So oh, I rather like that. Typical BBC, he hadn't actually seen it on BBC already because he never watched their own mm. stuff, these executives. But something rather sad happened. The morning after the Whittle film went out, there were very nice press reviews, but I was told Wilbert had died the night before. Oh. And uh, <coughs> I rang up the music and arts people at the BBC and I said, would you um, like to rerun it? And uh, they said, yeah. So that mm -hmm. explains why in April, the documentary got its second showing on mm. British TV and just the way things were back in the 90s you could make a lovely mm. film and you could make a pretty good one back then mm. 
came and went. Uh, might get repeated at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I didn't even get that honour. Genius of the Jet, the Whittle film, never got repeated in Britain either. What did happen was that BBC World came along and they showed it a lot. But uh, the, the bookmark series on BBC Two in which this went out, BBC never really did anything with it. And uh, after the editor left to go on to higher places, I think bookmark more or less just evaporated. So um, I was genuinely flattered to find that uh, it reappeared on YouTube probably about 12, 13 years ago in clips here and there. And the film got a new life and found a new audience. And, and there were quite a lot of bookmarks made. Each, episode, each series had maybe eight episodes, often about authors that nobody ever heard of. And uh, the idea of the Wilbur Audrey film was it was an attempt to be a bit more populist. Mm. Although the people I was dealing with at BBC were not very populist, shall we say. Mm. And yet that one, and oddly enough, another one about Edith Wharton, which I remember, seems to be the only two episodes of bookmark that have any ongoing life whatsoever. And mine is the only one that's available, albeit in limited edition. But I guess the reason being that not only are the books very popular, but also the TV series just goes on forever. When we were mm. filming it in 1994, I had no idea it would still be being produced in some form or other, mm. albeit in a very different form, shall we say. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Well, and I, I remember watching that the, the first airing of the Thomas the Tank Engine Man documentary on BBC Two in 1995, my, my grandparents had recorded it for me, because as we spoke about, I am a massive Thomas fan. Well, anything that was to do with Thomas, my grandpapa knew would be a winner. <coughs> and no, that's perfectly all right. And I absolutely loved it. I just loved it. I loved that's everything nice. about it. I mean- Very nice to hear because mm -hmm. there was nothing more satisfying than actually finding people who A, enjoyed watching it, but B, still remember it decades, mm -hmm later and um, yeah. uh, one thing i remembered in particular was it was the nice music that you used when and it would come up with the cards with some uh, information about it it was such yeah. lovely calming music uh, well, i always made me feel really safe but, and but i music. loved the whole thing around it like the way it was shot the way it was produced the interviews as well well obviously the footage with audrey is a highlight the footage with christopher another highlight but and um, mm. but so Tell me how it came to be and tell my audience how that uh, that came about. What, what was, how did the idea form? Sorry, what, how what came about? How, how the actual documentary came about. What, what was, what was the, the thing that got this process going? <coughs> okay, right. Where does it all begin? Obviously, I suppose it begins at some time in the 1960s when my mother is reading me bedtime stories, particularly of two books. Uh, three railway engines which is the first one mm -hmm. and um, four little engines which is book number 10 I think it, it's the one yeah. of, all my life I carried these images of Scarlowe and Sir Handel and Sir Hayden in my head more um, <clears throat> practically in 1993 my mother was on a on a high-speed train at, at Swindon going back to Wiltshire Chippenham and it was when people sat around tables in trains. It hadn't, the, the HSTs hadn't quite been turned into high-speed buses at that point, where you couldn't see over the seat in front. <coughs> and at Swindon, this guard blew a whistle on the platform and maybe even waved a green flag. And this little boy in, sitting in this table, or maybe in the next row of seats, shouted to his mummy, look, there's the fat controller, he said. And people smiled and laughed and thought nothing of it. My mother came back and told me that story, and I thought it was quite funny. And <clears throat> I wouldn't have had any thoughts about the books for decades. I was well aware that in the mid-80s, the David Mitten Brett Allcroft series started. And I remember thinking what wonderful publicity photographs it had. From the start, they seemed to capture the style of the Reginald Dolby era, which is my favourite era. Mm -hmm. But when my mum came back, she told me a story and she said, I wonder if Wilbur Orch is still alive. Now, you may think, well, just look up on your mobile phone and find out. But <clears throat> in 93, we did not have mobile phones. The internet was all very theoretical, hardly existed in practice then. So we got out an old copy of Who's Who, and we found that uh, Woolwood Audrey was indeed alive. His phone number was there, his house address was there, Sodor in Rodborough Road, I think, on the outskirts of the town of Stroud in Gloucestershire. 
he was not only alive, he was actually living barely 15 miles away from us, perhaps 18, um, just outside Stroud, and we were near Malmesbury. So my mother wrote a letter to him, and uh, he, <coughs> he replied straight away and agreed to meet. And she wrote an article for a magazine called The Oldie, which had a column called Still With Us. And uh, on this sort of premise that, my God, is he still alive? Or are he still with us? And, mm. and that he explained the story of the books. Maybe it's about 800 words. I've got a copy of the article somewhere. But uh, my mother also noticed, this would have been late 93 when the article came out, that um, 95 would, of course, be the 50th anniversary of the first book, Three Railway Engines. And <clears throat> stretching it a bit, I think it's the anniversary of the actual writing of the Thomas book, um, Thomas and Friends, with the famous cover, Smiling Engine. Yes. And she thought maybe I could turn it into a TV program. And um, we went along to meet Christopher Audrey. I think what happened was that Wilbert probably said to us, ah, you must meet Christopher. It's because, um, or maybe it was Hillary. I recall at late 93, we went back to Stroud to meet Wilbert and to just to learn more and he, he was still sitting up then. Uh, Hillary was there looking after him. His wife had died by then. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, he had a living carer. But um, I remember Hillary had a mini Metro. Do you remember that car? The yes. <laughs> baby yeah. Metro. Mm -hmm. And uh, she ushered us into this room. I, I couldn't help but notice when we knocked on the door of soda or one of those brass plates, which yeah. railway locomotives used to have, or maybe steam sheds had. And we went into this house where time stood still. I mean, Wilbert would have been about 82 by then. Yeah. And he obviously wasn't in great health, but he was still, his mental faculties were all there. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long for him to start showing us Henry's forest. And uh, <laughs> as you well know, he um, had very strong views at Henry's forest. What I've since yes. learned is that a lot of the fans actually rather like Henry's forest. Mm -hmm. This is a nice, um, this is a nice story, but it, the upshot was that we should go and meet Christopher, who'd taken over the writing of the books, and yeah. we met him in Arundel and uh, in Northamptonshire, and his son was there, Richard, who I yeah. didn't really speak to, but he, he's very much involved now in the, uh, well, I wasn't introduced to him, but he's very much involved now in the whole family, Audrey, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the, the, so, he, he, he's very much involved in keeping the flame fly, uh, flame alive, burning. Well. And I believe he may be the owner of the model railway or one of them, but uh, I digress. Well, Christopher told us what he'd been up to and he introduced us to read books. Now, I don't have the name of the person I met there. She is actually in the documentary. She's mm. the one saying, well, we've got a hundred thousand quid. We don't often get that sort of money. Yes. And she was the head of marketing, but read books was publishing was still quite a nice business in those days, nearly almost 30 years ago. And I offered the idea to Channel 4 and to the BBC and astonishingly, eventually, they both wanted to, to do it. And we went back to Wilbert and persuaded him against his better judgment. He didn't really want to be involved. We persuaded him to do uh, to, to record his story on film and um, yeah. uh, BBC had been first off the mark and uh, it I mean the film would have been a bit different had Channel 4 done it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the interest at Channel 4 believe it or not came from their long defunct religious department because of course Wilbert was a vicar. They had a yeah. series called Witness and oh. um, that was a story loosely associated to religion and moral yeah. issues and it would have been a perfect fit there. But BBC, I remember coming back one evening, phone call, lots of phone message, Friday evening, saying, stop, don't talk to Channel 4, we're really, really keen. And I thought, well, that's great. And um, we then went to, uh, we got the money, we were offered the money to film a, a, a Wilbert uh, telling his story. Mm -hmm. And straight, he, uh, by then, his health had declined further. He had osteoporosis, mm. which massively reduced his mobility. He was really keen to have us along. I recall he did ring me about a week before we turned up because it was a sunny day and I was standing 
by the window on the telephone, looking out over the Wiltshire countryside. He said, I feel it's taken the BBC rather a long time to come and film my story. And um, I could only say yes, exactly. So uh, it, it was part of a phenomenon which really became quite apparent and quite sad making the production, which is a lot of authors do not or never did write Robert Audrey. They, they, it was the same with Enid Blyton. It's not just that you're writing children's books. Roald Dahl writes children's books and nobody's ever rude about him. Well, they're rude about him because he could be quite horrid about people, but um, nobody ever criticised his works. But there's something about the works of Robert and of um, Miss Blyton that uh, they just seem to raise the hackles of other authors. But you know, they're a sneering crowd book writers, so it didn't worry me but I, I could see that it was this mindset that had stopped Wilbur getting the recognition he was entitled to and I don't think if it did get proper recognition as an author. Anyway we filmed him about the day before we were going to film him he had a fall he got up specially and he was therefore very heavily medicated for us on the day we did film him. Yeah. And um, it, it was very slow going at times but we, we got lots of um, nice bits of uh, storyline out of him. Uh, it's a very poignant story, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think, uh, I mean, the Wiltshire, the, the, the Audrey family are quite a well-known name in Wiltshire, mm -hmm. not far from where my company was registered. There's a little village called Notton, N-O-T-T-O-N, mm -hmm. on the line from Chippenham down through Melksham to... Um, Trowbridge, I think, and Bradford Junction. And there's this rather spooky looking country house, which used to belong to the Audreys, quite a hefty house. And I think it's there that Wilbert's grandfather, Sir John Withers Audrey lived. Yeah. And he was at one point, uh, he was a leading light, but also the chairman of a railway, I think called the Chippenham and Weymouth Railway that got absorbed into the Great Western. But that line is still there. It runs from Thingley Junction, just outside Chippenham, down through Melksham and uh, to Weymouth eventually, certainly via Westbury, Castle Carey, which has been in the news lately because it's Glastonbury yeah. link. But so we had a great time filming uh, Wilbert. And mm -hmm. the strange thing was that the letter from BBC was a bit ambiguous. I thought it was just a letter to say we want to film him. But in fact, it was a letter to go ahead and make the whole film. And you know, it's just one of those projects where after much pushing, everything started to, um, to happen and to move in the right direction. So in no time, I thought we must find a preserved railway to film. Mm -hmm. And the one that I, I, I looked at, I was given by Reed Books, uh, I think a list of where Thomas days out were going to be held. Yeah. And the most practical one coming up was at the start of October in Minehead on the West Somerset line. Yeah. And I went down to the line to um, meet the people, talk about it, and also to scout the locations. That's why I chose Blue Anchor. It's a beautiful station looking out over the sea. And we, we got, it, it was the day we actually did the film, it was pouring with rain, but then the rain would stop and the sun would come out. Mm -hmm. And Blue Anchor, the sun had pushed the rain clouds to one side. And with the sea in the background and the engine chuffing in, it almost looked Dolby-esque, I thought. Yeah. It had a, a kind of you know, feel of the 1950s. Very nice. And I, I showed around the signal box in Blue Anchor, which I always love going on signal boxes. And so I took all those photographs of them in the mm -hmm. 80s. And then it was a question of filming other people. Uh, yeah. We filmed Hillary giving a talk about the... Um, growing up with Thomas, as she called it. And my, mm -hmm. my mother is in the audience today, you see silver hair looking a bit like me. My mother is still alive, but in very poor health now. She'll be 94 in November. Mm -hmm. But uh, we uh, asked to film Christopher, and we filmed, we filmed him a bit later on at, uh, where was it, in Spalding. He was doing a book signing, which is mm -hmm. quite a job to get to in a hurry at a weekend. Yeah. But Christopher was on very good form when we, we filmed him. In the meantime, we filmed at um, Read Books. We also filmed out in Essex at the home of Eric Marriott, who was then alive. And Peter Edwards came along, along with one of the guys who had been <coughs> had to sell the books back in the 1950s. <coughs> and bit by bit, we built up a picture of the whole story. 
we also filmed um, at uh, Reed Books itself in mm-hmm. in Brompton in in central London, and that was good fun. We saw the artwork being restored and got out the old artwork from that safe with Rosemary Debenham. Yeah. In '94, all the many of the people who'd been involved in the early stages who would have actually worked with Tom, Edmund Ward, were still alive. Now, possibly one or two of them still are, I, I don't know. I met Reginald Dorby's daughter, but Sir Kate Holland, but I can't remember why, she wasn't in it. But Brian Sibley was writing his book at the time, and Brian was immensely helpful. And uh, he, we filmed him at the Swindon Railway Museum. Now, we filmed him at Swindon the same day we filmed Hillary, I think at the De Vere Hotel, giving her talk on yeah. growing up with Thomas. And we also filmed another chap at the Swindon Museum, um, found a, through the Rowan, one of the Rowan's unions, a retired steam train driver from South Wales who came along dressed in his uh, steam engine uniform. He still had yeah. it, his ovals and cap, shiny cap. <laughs> and <laughs> what I must also add is that we had a not a very easy day filming at Shepparton Studios, where I mm. thought we'd be the only people filming, but in fact we were part of a press day, but uh, mm. my colleague um, filmed on the set with David Mitten, who was absolutely wonderful. <coughs> we then, both of us, did a film interview with um, a Brit, Brit Allcroft, mm-hmm. and we also got some of the engines uh, including Boko. I was a bit yes. surprised to find Boko was in the book. So, because I remember that engine, it was a costly or something. It was considered yeah. a bit of a failure as a diesel back in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. Uh, uh, when it comes to the actual railway series and the Thomas Tank Engine series, Boko is a cult phenomenon. Well, he's one of my favourite engines as well. Well, um, <coughs> well, we asked him to read a story and he chose that one. It's a lovely story, wrong yeah. road. Yeah, because I, I remember like, um, looking at the, watching the documentary and I was like, I know that episode, that's Thomas in the special letter really? from series mm. four. And I remember seeing Boko and I remember seeing the footage Donald and Douglas and they were testing them on the track for, for shots. And well, it was it was like a dream come true for, like, I would have been eight years old at the time, an eight year old kid getting to I see all the, yeah. all this stuff. It was it was absolutely beautiful and getting to uh, see the interviews with Brett and getting to see like Christopher like, and Hillary like, and just seeing everything that was related to it for me. It was mind blowing. Like even hearing you talking about it right now, and I'll be and I'm thirty five. Like it's still mind blowing. Like it's it's so great. Like to be able to speak to someone who not only spoke with the Reverend himself, but spoke to David Mitten, Christopher Audrey, like Brett Allcroft. Like, like I'm I'm absolutely blown away. Like and what like, you may and you may not realise it, but you'll probably realise it soon when there are pre orders for your DVD shoot up. Like. It was such an integral part of everybody's childhood, your documentary, myself included. Well, I remember going to my grandpapa's afterwards, what that had been recorded, and they would always have, they'd always have the video ready because they knew I would want to watch it. And I would watch it while I was uh, reading my annuals and playing with my Ertel Thomas trains, while like doing Thomas colouring in. Like everything was Thomas, like in, in any form, in any content. Like, so if you made someone like me, were well, extremely happy as a child. There are so many others that have been well, inspired by it as well. Many people well, would be inspired to do documentaries as well because of your work. Well, it's well, it still holds up today. Like the, well, I can't. I seen obviously the trailer for the rest, uh, the restoration footage. Like, really? and it's well, fantastic. <laughs> like, obviously, like because I went straight to your website well, and was like buying, buying, buying. Well, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm such a huge fan. I know I'm 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 gushing like I'm kind of breaking my stern uh, per, uh, presenter personality, but I am a, I am a huge fan of everything involved in Thomas, and you are part of that legacy, Nicholas. Well, very flattered. I mean, I'm <laughs> glad to have um, brought you plenty of joy in your childhood. What mm-hmm. I should add was that there were two other things we wanted. One was to actually film the American version being filmed, and. Mm-hmm. We were told we could film on set with Rick Sigelko. My colleague John went to the US, Canada rather. I had got a new passport to go out, especially that fell yeah. apart at the last minute. Although we did, he went, uh, we, we did get footage in Canada. Yeah. But um, I mean, some people in the Brit Allcroft group were not very easy to deal with, shall we say. Brit Allcroft Company, I think it was called. And mm. uh, secondly, I was really keen, one, to get good archive. And I wanted to get 
lovely footage along the sea wall in Dawlish, uh, 1950s steam trains and lots of people going on holiday in red and cream carriages. And although I found some footage, it never got used. What I did find was Ivor Peters' uh, footage of the engines going up um, the Licky Incline. Now, I yes. think that's what we want because it's the Licky Incline, not far from King's Norton, where Warburg would have been inspired to read the story to, or make up the story to Christopher about the engine pushing up the hill. It almost mm. replicated his childhood in box between Middle yep. Hill and the yep. main the, se the second story of that book, Edward and Gordon. Well, I always mm. remember well, uh, hearing the, well, what, well, again, watching the documentary and got seeing that footage and having the, what, reading of the story behind it as well and again it was it was like watching what uh, the book come to life for me <coughs> it, it was it was so fantastic getting to see these like these engines and like this inspiration like and let's say a lot of the fans like felt the same like they still feel the same about it uh, so like tell Should tell my audience else, uh, yeah, cool. uh, we, um, I really wanted, uh, I discovered when researching the idea that Pete Waterman was a great fan and I insisted we filmed him and to my dismay the BBC cut it out. He was oh. talking about how, I remember it's a lovely book, it says all children love Thomas but I especially look forward to my Christmas because, I, oh, he said all children love Christmas but I especially look forward to my Christmas because I knew I'd be getting the new Thomas book coming out <laughs> and he told a very sort of folksy story about some um, living in Coventry in the 19, uh, late 40s and early 50s and uh, he of course became a steam train driver however on the uh, Blu-ray stroke DVD one of the bonus features will be clips from my film interview with Pete Waterman talking wow. about and this will be the first time it's been seen. Secondly I was determined to find a writer who would say nice things about the books and do a proper assessment <coughs> and we wrote to one writer after another and a lot of them were just sneering and dismissive of the books but one guy was really good and that was Michael Rosen and wow. it was a wonderful day filming with Michael. Yeah. He was great fun and uh, he told me something funny. He he, he said that as a child, he lived in um, Pinner in Middlesex, where I used to live as a child. On the, it's on the Great Central Line on the one hand and the Metropolitan, but also on the old LNWR, the West Coast Line, as it's now called. <clears throat> he said his older brother, no, he said he used to go train spotting with Michael Portillo's older brother. Wow. And uh, this was long before there was any suggestion that Michael Portillo I'd end up on telly, but yes. um, I've always associated it, the Portillo Senior with railways, yeah. and it's a bit of an irony that Michael Portillo <laughs> has, uh, after failing to become Prime Minister, shall we say, <laughs> has ended up being on telly as a travelogue and train expert, because mm. I think it's more his older brother who <laughs> liked, the, um, liked the trains, but Michael was fantastic and mm. uh, he was one of the best uh, people to meet in the film, along with Pete Waterman, who you will now be able to see in yeah. the, uh, <clears throat> the Blu-ray stroke DVD via yeah. the extra features. But also uh, my colleague John went to uh, Japan and uh, yeah. all those wonderful scenes mm. of that boy, boy yeah, shopping. I, I remember Japan watching that there. and thinking, wow, I want to live there. It was so, it was so beautiful just seeing all mm. those toys. It was fantastic. Well, and, and finding out as well, like obviously, because back in the 90s, what, 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 we didn't know really about Shining Time Station in the UK. No, what, we didn't. Uh, I, I'd never even what, heard of it until what, 1994. And, <laughs> what, and, no, and we didn't really know that it had become so popular in places like Japan and the United States because, what, as you said before, that, like, you know, it was very much on the phone. What, internet was not even really a thing but it was something that when I as I got older and found out more about it well like that was one of the first things that really liked me that this is a worldwide phenomenon I think uh, from one of the things I remember from the Japanese one was, did they not say that uh, they told them that they invented Thomas sorry because, you're cracking up can you speak a bit louder but no of course um one of the things in the, uh, the documentary that I watched uh, when they went over to Japan well, yes. I think they said that it was them that created Thomas. Well, they were saying that to 
like their audience. I remember see. Uh, I, t- I can't remember if it was your documentary or another one. Well, I'll I'll soon find out when I get the DVD. But I remember seeing it, going, "Wow, did they really, really say that? Did they really claim that?" <laughs> It's extraordinary. I <clears throat> can remember how Japan was seen almost 30 years ago. Yeah. It was um, very, very, well, it still is a very rich country, but mm. it seemed to be much more prosperous than the West at the time. And it cost an absolute fortune to film in Japan. I remember giving, um, collecting £3,000 in petty cash for the crew as a float, which is wow. certainly about 10 grand today, carrying it on the underground. But, um, yeah, I was surprised too, <laughs> clutching it under my jacket. But the um, funny thing was that there just seemed to be a thoroughness about Japan, the way they did the toys, the way that Sony <coughs> put it out in this series and uh i'm kiki i think uh, and, and uh yeah it's J- japan at the time was associated with thoroughness and hyper efficiency and mm-hmm. taking western things and and doing them uh, better like making cars yeah. for example mm. <laughs> the, well, one, of the, the well, one of the things that was well known was their tomi range of thomas the tank engine what uh, the kind of electric engines that they were doing what of, of the thomas and that became like a very popular like um what thing to buy what it was very much a, like a cultural kind of phenomenon what many mm. people collect them but well, obviously we had the ertel what ones what the right, ertel trades yeah. what which which i have and i am so thankful that i have them but and what well, then obviously i had hornby as well hornby's relationship with the uh with the thomas merchandise is fantastic well, we it's been from Ertel, didn't we uh, mm-hmm. it was well, man telling us how much money Thomas was making in parts of the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's absolutely like uh, like crazy. I mean, in particular, like we all know the railway series by by the Rev, but Christopher Audrey's books are so rare. What like, they're so hard to get that the second really? yes, what well, um what well, if what well, please pass me on Christopher's details. Now, be like right, we released the books. So you have a massive demand. <laughs> If not for oh. me, for your son. <laughs> I, I, ha- I was given a copy of all of the books in a special box edition in 1994 from number wow. one right through to number 42. But guess what? I gave them out to relatives who liked Thomas and they didn't all come back. What oh. I did do was I got Wilbert to sign my ten book number 10, Four Little Engines. Oh, and that's amazing. That's <laughs> when amazing. I him, when I met him, he was amazed that I still remembered the story with the traction yeah. engine and a man called Jem Cole. Yes. <laughs> but I, yes. I, I'd just been talking to him about the books on his shelf. By then he was effectively bedbound, living in his bedroom. Mm. And the bookshelves on one of the wall, the, the bookshelves lined one of the walls. And there were lots of very small books in a funny language. And yeah. I said, uh, can you tell me about those books? He said, they're all in the Manx language, as in the Isle of Man. Yeah. And I said, oh, I said, I said, have you read them all? And he looked at me and said, I have read each one five times. And I, I thought, wow. I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he actually a, learned the Manx language. Yeah. Well, it's the same with his books as well. Uh, countless times we've read them. Countless times I watched the series as a child. Video going in, rewind, play, rewind, play. Well, it was probably the best babysitter my mum and dad ever had for me. <coughs> but, um, I absolutely loved love thomas i still do so <coughs> so uh how many like uh do you still keep in contact with any of the people that you interviewed from the documentary like for like basically me saying have you got christopher audrey's number um now christopher how should i put it he's a bit more reclusive than the others he, he must be quite old by now i mean must be 80 no, oh, hang on. If he's two in 82, he must be now, I think. Wow. Uh, born in 1940. And yeah. um, the, Hillary, sadly, is no longer with us. I would mm. very much like to meet Christopher again, but mm. I'm in close contact with the other daughter, whom I did not meet, in fact, when making the film. That's so Veronica and her husband, Veronica Chambers, and also their son, Mark Chambers, who I met in fact uh, I, I met them via um well through the auspices of daniel coffee and yeah. also uh, we ended up filming mark and veronica for an unlikely fandom which uh, and also ah. for tom's film as well now <clears throat> i'm in an unlikely fandom <clears throat> i've also oh, done brilliant. a fair bit of the fun brilliant because well, uh, because uh, uh, that's something that the thomas fan community is 
desperately looking forward to seeing the unlikely well, it's fandom. Coming out in, um, <clears throat> it's coming out at Christmas, I think. And I, I provided bits and pieces for it, but also I, I'm in it. But I, I, my colleague and I, I directed the filming that was done in England and Wales. We didn't get to Scotland. We did have someone come down from Scotland and also somebody from Northern Ireland um, mm -hmm. in the form of um, uh, Michael White from Ulster and uh, Ryan from, uh, not far from you, I suspect, Stirling. At, mm -hmm. um, we filmed Tom Jetsky and Thomas Carter for yeah. it in London. But after that, that was just after we had filmed uh, um, Daniel Coffey, who, who's this wonderful collection of uh, of uh, books, and, and uh, who else? Um, oh, Mike O'Donnell, of course. Yeah. I filmed uh, I filmed Mike for my own bonus feature for the uh, yeah. for the special edition, limited mm -hmm. edition, Blu-ray stroke DVD. It's simply called A Chat with Mike O'Donnell, and it, it's yeah. really good. I think you will all really enjoy that when you get to see it. But also. Yeah. Um, I asked uh, Daniel, because he's been such a helpful contributor to the restoration project, uh, if he'd like to come along and see the filming. And I said, could he bring some books? He brought some wonderful mm. early edition books from the Railway series along. So wow. we made up a montage of those for the Mike O'Donnell extra. Oh, wow. That's, that's absolutely I guess amazing. I guess we could use the Pete Waterman thing as well, actually, come to think of it, because... Yeah. Uh, Peter's, I think Peter Waterman was born in about 1945, so he's, he's therefore grew up with the books, but he's recalling the age when you had these um, books coming out once a year. I mean, when yeah. I was a child, the big treat used to get the new Beatles record every year, this was back in the 60s. Yeah. And, <clears throat> I don't know if people, oh yeah, there's still a thing called the Christmas record, isn't there? Although yeah. the, the days of physical records are largely gone. But um, Pete talked about how wonderful it was to get the new Railway Series book each um, each Christmas. And he also said yeah. that uh, he never forgot the lesson of, I can't do it, oh yes you can. He said that yeah. helped him, propel him to a quite spectacular success in the uh, in the musical industry. But of course he also worked on the railways and I gather he's got this, one of the best model <coughs> railways in Britain in this instance yes. of Lowington yeah. Spa's Great Western Station. Yep. That's a, it's absolutely fantastic. And well, mm. we touched on Michael Donnell as well. And he's had a bit of a resurgence because he's been bringing out uh, remastered That's copies right. of yeah, like yeah. the. We mentioned those. So we, we say in our bonus feature where you can get them. That, that'll be mentioned in the film. But yep, he, he's, yep. I think he's been very pleased, Mike has been, to find the fans' renewed interest or mm. new interest in mm. the work that he's been doing. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he again, I've also got copies of them as well. <laughs> All right, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like anything that's Thomas related that you can get your hands on, you're just like, but we need to get it because it's never a case, as far as I'm concerned, the Thomas, it's never been a case of like, you know, reviving the fandom. It's always been there. It's just now we fortunately have ways to get access to it. Like, like for example, through the the documentary, like where like that's been that's been released. Michael Donald re-releasing his music, like, and we're we're itching to get that. All we need is to try and get, uh, I think it's Egmont Publishing that own the book rights now. Get them to re-release Christopher Audrey's, and they will sell like hotcakes. Everybody is what. Like, yeah, uh, I, I I don't know what the arrangement is. Mm. I guess it gets tied up into Mattel books, but mm. I, I think the Audrey family are quite close to Mattel books now. Mm. And um, purely separate note, I, I saw that Britt Allcroft reappeared on Facebook the other day. Yes. And maybe I saw but, something this morning that she said she'd mm. been off for a few months because she'd been poorly. And I, mm. I hope she's better now. I constantly get poorly myself. And, yeah. Um, the future of getting old. But uh, I, uh. The, what I think is so sad is that David Mitten can no longer be around to mm -hmm. see the um, huge interest that still exists. I, it was a great pleasure to uh, film him at Shepparton that cold and wet day in yeah. October 94. It really was horrible weather that day. Yeah. <coughs> but he was so helpful and cooperative. Mm -hmm. He had a kind of confidence and a charm. But I've learned a great deal more about his work, also that of Rick Sigelkow in North America. And... I really think that David is one of the great uh, unsung heroes of post-war mm -hmm. children's television. 
Oh, definitely. Um, like he's, he's still widely respected and widely regarded, especially amongst the Thomas fandom and the Tugs fandom. Mm. Why? Well, because he obviously went off. Yeah, and I done. learned a lot about Tugs recently too, yes. Yes, mm. well, definitely. Well, and... Mike worked on Tugs, he told us. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, and it was, well, it was, fan- it was fantastic. Well, it was one of those rare series. Well, it's only 13 episodes long. And there's as much clamour for any behind the scenes or extra cuts of episodes because they were constantly cut for time. What and we're we're all like, do these twenty minute cuts exist rather than these fifteen minute cuts? And what like the Tugs project has done great work mm. with uh, raising awareness for it again as well. What and it's just it's absolutely fantastic. What recently uh, I don't know if you'd seen there'd actually been some leaked uh, images of uh, David Mitten had drawn what some of the the TV series Sodor Map as of series three. Well, and the internet just blew up. Well, um, a lot of the fandom have been going into it, analyzing it, trying to figure out where it ties in with the parts of the TV series. Well, it's it's a great time to be a uh, to be a Thomas fan right now. What and then when we yeah, had no, the, it, it's some, I mean, hope I can <laughs> contribute in some small way towards that because uh, yeah. I only have a, a relatively small number of uh, of copies available we're talking hundreds not yeah. um thousands but uh yeah. there so. will always be a uh, renewed interest but i would not be surprised what if what the uh, these sell out so quickly that you'll have to get more and probably get more for like what uh, places like in america because they obviously they have a different region well, DVDs see, what, as well that, I, I thought one central is to have them both blu-ray and dvd because on the crowdfund people did actually say i don't have a blu-ray player do you have a dvd Options. Yeah. Obviously, I said yeah. So it, it's not that mm-hmm. difficult to. But once you've done one, you've done the d- done the other. But uh, I've been astonished, in fact, talking to younger people, and then we're up to the age of thirty odds. How mm-hmm. popular the Blu-ray still is among fans, because mm-hmm. the Blu-ray is considered in TV film industry a bit of a failure. Hasn't really mm-hmm. taken off, and yet Blu-ray copies of films are very sought after, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And they've got a kind of niche uh, value. Yeah. Yeah, but, they do. Uh, the it's, like, it's like myself. <laughs> yeah, it's like myself. I don't have a Blu-ray player. But, uh, my mum and dad do, but I, I I stuck with DVD, and I was just really hoping it wouldn't go the same way as like VHS, because I was recollecting all the Thomas episodes in DVD form, and I've got them all safe and what well, and kept nice. And I was like, if they all come out on Blu-ray as well, uh, and I've got to rebuy them all because they become obsolete. So when I saw there was a DVD option, I was ecstatic for ordering your DVD. Thank well, you because I did for a while, this was probably about between about 12 and maybe six years ago, certainly up until 2015. I, yeah, 2015, I would get requests for the actual main film. Nothing else then existed beyond that. And I said, look, all I've got is a super VHS taken off a transmission copy. It looks perfectly good, mm. but uh, it is a super VHS, albeit a super one, not a VHS yeah. one. And I've made, I've sold people burns of those. And maybe there are I don't know, 30, 40 out there in existence that I've sold. But um, the picture quality is okay. On mm. the DVD and Blu ray, it will be vastly better, of course. But the uh, <clears throat> intriguing thing was that <laughs> people who wanted it, really did want it 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 is Mm -hmm. not like where it's not one of those films where you just go into tesco if they still even sell dvds and say Mm -hmm. right i want a dvd let's see what i find i'll buy one and take it home it's Mm -hmm. it's what i call a guerrilla raiding you set out to get something and you get it yes definitely and and you enjoy it all all the more for that yeah, and I won't be surprised that if those uh, after like the well, once your DVD is out for well, it's obviously out for pre-order just now, but once it's what well, people have got it or watch it again, the VHS super VHSs that you've sold, I can guarantee they will be on eBay hitting at least a hundred pound per pop, well, and probably putting on bidding wars for it because that's what the fandom do. What well, they love to collect it, they love any type of thing for Thomas, what well, any fandom really that they can get their I hands am. on from what from. <coughs> from those glory days what and it's yeah just absolutely fantastic what i mean i'm i, I was on the phone with my grand and papa and i was like do you still have the the vhs recording what even what so i could just rewatch it again what and what but then sadly I'm I'm separate grand, it, actually um, yeah so I, i've got one with both that and the frank whittle documentary on which both went out in 97 yeah. of course what um 
what I have noticed, I've been a little bit shocked to find that lots of, what are, not relics, but, but um, what's the word I want? Uh, items from the mm -hmm. TV series, particularly the early days, occasionally have been rescued out of a skip or something and companies are reselling them. And I don't know how genuine some of these things are or even how rare they are because I, I know they had lots and lots of copies of faces at the Shepherd and I'm astounded at the amount of money fans are paying for these things, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But, um, <clears throat> but, when, but when you see what the what what they do with them like in particular uh, one of the i think one of the biggest ones is tom's props what like, and what like, they've they've restored a lot of like, items like um like, oh some, uh, i am um, like yeah, tom's some, got wonderful uh, wonderful yeah. props hasn't he yeah, yeah especially like, great collections especially because they've got, Daniel stuff. <clears throat> especially because they've got sir handel and duke what well, that was that what well, they're also like massive cult figures well, in the Thomas series as a whole as well. well uh, Tom and Thomas Carter they displayed their Percy and Thomas. And I think yeah. was it the yes, at the railway exhibition in Basingstoke. You're aware there's a show mm -hmm. in Basingstoke. Yes. In yes. Did you I, go saw what, I never got a chance to go down, but I've a hike it. from Coatbridge, I'm sure. It's yeah. hard enough getting there from London because the trains ironically weren't running between um <laughs> Well, past Woking uh, onto mm. Basingstoke, you had to catch yeah. a coach from Gildra, which I did not yeah. enjoy. And mm. uh, then a clapped out old bus in the 1940s took us to this old school on the outskirts of Basingstoke. Yeah. This was the first model railway exhibition I'd been to probably since 1979. I remember going to one that year and yeah. I was astounded. I mean, there was it used to be a big one in Central Hall in London. And I remember going mm. there and said, I was astounded at the... Um, the sheer quality of the model railways, the imagination that yep. went into them. I, I really thought that model railways would be on the way out by now and the whole preserved railway thing. I'm also very involved in aviation heritage mm -hmm. through the Frank Whittle, Eric Brown films I've done. Yeah. And how shall I put it? Aviation heritage faces a far more uncertain future. And I think that's for two reasons. One, you have to, if you're going to preserve an aircraft, you need an airfield to put it on. Mm -hmm. And the temptation of whoever owns the airfield to build houses on it is enormous. But mm -hmm. secondly, you cannot really take your fan base up in the aircraft because mm -hmm. at best they've got one seat for the pilot. Secondly, it's a brave man who goes into an aircraft 60, 70, 80 years old. Yeah. Whereas by contrast, I was down at the mid Hans line, a lovely place. And um, that's where I took that picture of Thomas, in fact, or an engine looking like Tom's. And of course, yeah. with preserved railways, you can go on one, I mean, mm -hmm. sit in a nice spacious old Mark 1 or 2 carriage, like when I was young, they're everywhere. And yeah. you can actually have a train ride. It may not be a cheap one, but um, it's far more fun than going on a, a real train these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they're not yeah. running much at the moment anyway. <clears throat> but the, yeah. uh, the, the whole um, world of railway preservation, I had thought would be defunct almost by now because... Mm. I have got the haziest memories of steam engines when young and very hazy, you know, just a plume of smoke in the distance. You realize, ah, oh, that's a train. But um, obviously I've seen them in preserved railways. I can barely even remember the diesel engines of the seventies. But mm. the uh, intriguing thing is that model railways and real preserved railways seem to have got a new lease of life in part through things like Thomas and Friends. Mm -hmm. It's almost put a kind of working model, not a yeah. working model, a kind of example for a working model on a little kid's TV series. I know this series has changed a little bit in the last few years, but mm. um, Thomas can now do somersaults on the track and Rule 55 yeah. has clearly gone out of the window. Oh. That's progress. Well, but I mean, we, I mean, imagine what Wil Wilbert Audrey would think if in the third series, which is considered now as part of the classic golden age of thomas and he had an issue then imagine what he would be thinking of all engines go right now that or wow well, it's funny <sighs> every time i see one of these um modern adaptations my mm. first thought is what would um what would wilbert make of this and uh, mm. Said uh, Rule Fifty Five is the least of his uh, worries. If the engine isn't even obliged to stay on the track in mm -hmm. the latest one from Mattel, but yeah. I, I was, it was last year. I, I went to the Midhance the first time. I took that nice photo. I went with Tom and his dad, 
and uh, I was astonished to meet one or two, I don't mean boys, about 10, 11, who were impressed when they, I was impressed that they knew the my documentary and, and they were impressed to meet the guy who did it. But yeah. the uh, the way this model railways had become, not model railways, preserved railways, had become mm. so smart with nice car parks and catering and chalet cottages to stay in by the side. And mm. um, I think, I think one of the stations on uh, the Mid Hans it was. I remember uh, I was involved in the 6024 Preservation Society once, and <coughs> it wasn't far from me. I was in Milton Keynes. I edited their magazine, and it's a long, long time ago. But Quainton Road, as it was then called, it's now, I think, the North Backing of Shirawa Centre, Bucks Centre. You're lucky to get your car out of there in one piece because the <laughs> roads into the station were just a series of potholes. And on wet days, there were puddles with potholes underneath them where your car would go down yeah. a hole. It was not meant to be fun going to a model a preserved railway mm. 40, 30 years ago. <laughs> <coughs> but it's become a fantastic day out now, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, um... Well, one of my wife, uh, her brother stays down in Hull, and we, anytime we go down, well, we always go to the the railway museum in York. Well, it's just mm. it's, it's such a lovely experience. Well, and this year will be the first time we'll be going as a family since we've had the the kids. Well, and I am I'm so looking forward to taking them and just did I, the, um, I tell you this as a spin off from doing the bookmark not only the, the Thomas Tank Engine Man documentary not only did I hear from Enid Blyton's daughter I also got a phone call <clears throat> from a curator at the National Railway Museum who said can you make a six minute film about the royal train for not very much money I said yeah of course I can so yeah. I met her and she said well everyone else has said they can't do it for that money and I said oh we'll, we'll do yeah. it somehow yeah. and working with the Huntley archive I made this rather nice little film six minutes long mm -hmm. which I am getting Re, re sort of master, shall we say? Some yeah. of the archive I've got, it's on a VHS, but it, it, the story of the Royal Train's never really been told. Mm -hmm. And um, we made it in that long, hot summer of 1995. It's a lovely film yeah. to make. I'm hoping to get a copy of that up on my website as well, probably as a, a download. I called it the yeah. Royal Road because I know that's what the Great Western used to be called, but yeah. really I called it that because it's Royal Trains. But mm -hmm. it was fascinating to see the archive of the Royal Train in the 1940s and 50s. How magnificent the Queen and her husband looked on the, their wedding day when they went yeah. from Waterloo. But there's this quite sort of hilarious um, yeah. news clip of the Queen, the Queen Mother, a very young Prince Charles and Princess Margaret with an army of dogs getting on the train at uh, Liverpool Street to go to, to Sandringham. And wow. That, that's probably filmed in about 1953, 54, but uh, yeah. it, it is, it, it, it was a nice little train and a nice little yeah. film. I was intrigued to find the Royal Train remained steam hauled well into the diesel mm. age because nobody thought it would work behind the diesel, it might break down. However, mm. that all was a spin off from doing the, the, the Thomas thing. And I worked with the Huntley mm. Film Archives. They've got a wonderful collection of old, uh, wow. old railway trains, but I, I didn't realize Royal Trains are as old as railways and they used to mm -hmm. advance the technology. I, she's a long forgotten queen called Queen Adelaide, who mm. was the queen just before Victoria, her husband was mm. William IV, her uncle. She had her own royal train and up to the day she died and Queen Victoria, of course, had one yeah. and near her home to you, she managed to get across the, the Tay Bridge before it collapsed, didn't she? Wow. Yeah, she did indeed. And she was, well, one of the things that we always like, re remember for Queen Victoria was the steam age. It was kind of that golden age like, that came about during that that run. Like, and, like, and obviously, like, Flying Scotsman was popular around that mm. time as well. Like, and like, he's still popular. He's, he's, the, he's the train that any like go to like, fan who, who knows their stuff like, or even just wants to learn more. Flying Scotsman is usually the place to start. Well, I should say that because you know this book I'm going to bring out uh, later yes. in the summer. Mm. I was showing the pictures to Tom Jetski, and purely by chance, I had gone up to Derbyshire. Uh, I'd be setting off from Milton Keynes, which is why I could never get as far as Scotland, which still had some wonderful old railways well into the ages. I was going to Derbyshire to a, a place called New Mills, which had a lovely old railway set up into the mid 80s, and I noticed a load of people with 
waiting by the bridge and cars parked there and waiting on the embankment with their cameras at a place called Chinley on the way up from Manchester yeah. down to, I guess, towards Derby, the old Midland line. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll wait. I've got my camera out. And guess what came chuffing through the Flying Scotsman in wow. 1984? I, I, so I put the picture there in the book because I've also got Blue Peter, but at Didcot. I had no idea that the Flying Scotsman was still such a popular uh, yeah. engine. I remember in 1968 or 9 when I was a child, it went on a journey from King's Cross to Edinburgh mm -hmm. with Alan Pegler. And yeah. Wilbur Audrey was actually filmed sitting in one of the carriages talking about it, wasn't he? It was not Indeed, yes. Like, and, like, and then obviously Flying Scotsman got taken over to America and like, there's, there's oh, other... Oh yeah, it went all, all over the place. Because yeah. when we were working on 6024, it was reckoned in the 80s that steam engines would no longer be allowed on the railway at all. That was the BR plan, but they've had quite a lease of life. They're, they're chuffing in and out mm -hmm. of London all the time now, pulling people, paying a packet for dinner, as far as I can see. Yeah, definitely. Like, and But it's something that well, it's it's something that's instilled like kind of through the generations. But um, but I had a guest on my my podcast. Uh, she's a she's a, a vicar and a comedian, uh, Maggie Whitehouse, and her father actually owned like a uh, like a steam, well, a steam train. He'd he bought it outright and restored it, and what well, and it was the same. What like, the uh, she got to go to what like, to China to uh, write books about the uh, the railways over uh, system over in China, which was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so she got to do that as well with her dad. Well, and what well, she she became a fireman when or a fireman when she was twelve, because what well, she got because she just was on that train with her dad all the time. What well, and learning how to uh, how to drive it. They le learn fireman. Well, and it's it's so fascinating and it's something that does it just gets instilled what well, through the generations and what well, this was me just I was what well, uh, talking to someone who I thought she's a stand up comedian and a vicar. And then I find out that she'd, she'd met, you know, uh, Wilbert Audrey what, and what like, they'd been to his railway. And it was the same, kind of the same as when I was talking, when I'm talking to you, I'm like, 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 pure, like really, really excited. Like it's, it's so fascinating. And it's one of the things that I love doing. Like when it comes to this type of thing, you get to hear so many amazing stories. I mean, but to speak to someone who is like people who were in the presence of someone who is so loved and revered around the world, like uh, Melbourne Audrey, and to be part of that story, it's it's mind blowing for me. Well, I it's, think, well, I, I've often wondered what is the appeal of his stories, and mm -hmm. I think I was telling you that when I was um, when I, after the film went out, I met Enid Blyton's daughter, Gillian, mm -hmm. and she said to me that her mum was such a good child children's author because. In many ways, she still retained the mind of a child. She knew how a child thought, mm -hmm. and uh, she could write in a way that would appeal to children. And when Wilbert says at the end of the documentary, I'd like to remember it as an author who perhaps understood a child, a children, how a child's mind worked. That's a, an author who perhaps understood children, perhaps understood how a child's mind works. I don't know. It was. Uh, he is bang on the nail there because mm -hmm. successful children's authors do manage to get into the mind of a child, whereas an awful lot of them, probably more today than ever, are preaching like mad at children. But Wilbur, in fact, said he himself, in the, uh, well, around the time of the First World War is ending, he and his brother had to read these children's books, which were really just morality tales to tell children how to behave, and uh, mm -hmm. they didn't like them at all. It, it, I, I think he took children's writing in a new direction, but uh, as I really said earlier, the uh, attitude of other writers towards him was sneering and condescending. Mm. There's one uh, author from whom I have a letter, which I'd, I'd asked if she'd like to be in the film, and I suppose I'd better not mention her because she may still be alive, but um, she uh, she actually, I've got this note, I couldn't believe it rereading it the other week for the first time in years. She said, I've always found his books rather meretricious, in other words, of worth, a smart ass word, but of worth, not worthy of serious consideration. But then she said, but perhaps that's why you're studying him anyway. And I thought, give it wow. a rest. You know, it's, it's the, the snobbery that people yes. have shown towards Wilbert. And the simple truth is that in Britain, particularly in England, nothing brings out the worst in a person than being a successful author. They mm. look down on the rest of the world and um, academics particularly yeah. are the most censorious bunch. But many years ago, I, I saw this fantastic movie called Shadowlands, 
with yes. Anthony Hopkins yeah. about Clive Lewis. And I just rem remember the Chronicles of Narnia as a child, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But what I um, didn't realise was that <coughs> he himself was brilliant at writing for children. And mm. I think Brian Sibley was actually involved in the early development of uh, Shadowlands, uh, made it part of the, the great phenomenon. That, have you seen the film Shadowlands? I have, yes. Well, uh, well I'm a big fan of Sir Anthony Hopkins. Well, it's, all right. Well, it's wonderful because not many people know about it, uh, mm. but it, it is a marvellous movie. I saw it at BAFTA at a preview and Richard Attenborough came along to give a, a talk about it. And there was hardly a dry eye in the house. It's such a mm -hmm powerful emotional film it's a really inspiring film but what i did like was and this is attenborough obviously remembering the 50s they, they go backwards and forwards on steam trains from paddington to oxford a lot yeah. they filmed it on the great central in i think loughborough and they got the dirty state of a 1950s engine to perfection didn't they yes. that's what for me made the film so good one thing that I really despair of it in preserved railways is they're always so immaculately clean, particularly in mm. film and TV adaptations. Yes. As if they even now to get the railway right. I remember mm. there were years ago, there was a, a very good drama called Cream in My Coffee, 42 years ago, mm. set in Eastbourne, and they actually filmed the engine puffing out at probably Horsted Keynes. And therefore they got they got the railway right. But nowadays it's quite common to have a Midland Railway train when it's set in southwest England, that mm. sort of thing. They, 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 they no longer really care because they don't know their uh, trains. But the, um, the, the use of that mucky old engine on the Great Central, I thought was a really mm -hmm. inspired, um, yeah. inspired choice. But you know, you, you've got all sorts of funny preserved trains now. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me to see an, an air conditioned coach in the 70s Painted chocolate and cream looks very, very weird. I think the trains are just a little bit too perfect now on the preserved railways. Mm, I think it is one of the things though, that they do. You have to try and they want they want to take pride in their work, and I totally understand and respect that. Like, uh, definitely. But as oh, you yeah. said, if they were if they were in proper working steam, like, they would not look so immaculate. But that's it's one of the things like people said to me that uh, I've said and probably said to yourself as well. Steam engines are the closest thing to life that uh, humans have created. Well, you know, like like the artificial intelligence, like it's in the way that you you warm up the train, the way you get it set up, the way it comes into steam. It's just like it, as it's like it's coming to life. What well, and I've always found that fascinating, and you always felt that with reading Audrey's books as well. But among the, the fan community, and one of the things that I try and do with uh, the series Railway Reviews is to show that Wilbert Audrey was not just what, an author who understood a child's mind. He also understood his audience that he was growing up with. He wrote those books over like 27 years. The people who were getting them read to them as children at bedtime yeah. were probably reading the later issues to their kids what, while they were coming out. What, and they dealt with such what uh, heavy hitting topics they dealt with nationalization they dealt with the rise of diesel engines they, de they didn't shy away from the fact that engines would be scrapped well and i remember one of the uh illustrations i think it was from uh, uh step me the bluebell engine that was uh when the the edwards both took over the illustrations it terrified me because it looked because it was engines that were just waiting to be scrapped it filled me with such fear, but uh, and that just showed how good it was. And the writing as well of, well, uh, well, obviously Percy recanting this story of, well, you know, on the bad railway, which is all, which was our nationalised railway, they were getting cut up. So engines were trying to escape to find a better life on Sodor. These are things that like, what the fans love to digest, they love to look into. Well, and well, to say that Audrey was, uh, what is being looked down on upon offers, but I would say, there's a reason why Audrey is so remembered and so loved among fans around the world. What he understood children, he understood the adults that had to read the stories to the children. And in my case, what, uh, when my sons were, uh, they were premature, so they were in hospital for six weeks. What, um, what, so every every afternoon I was going in to see them and I would take, I took my 60 year anniversary railway series. They're great handbag. fans too, are they? Yep, yep. I would take them in what, and I would read them the stories. Well, every day well, and it's it's such a beautiful memory that I'll hold on to forever it was something that gave me real hope in a dark time well, and... I just remembered something that Christopher Audrey said to me he said that in the 1950s the 
sketches, the, the artwork in the book, even then seemed a bit unreal because he said in the 1950s, most trains and the locomotives pulling them were scruffy and dirty. O only the really immaculate express trains got the um, you know, polished green paintwork or maroon. He, mm. he said that even in the 1950s, the railway seemed in the or in the um, Dolby artwork to be out of a different age. Mm. That you had to go back to pre-World War One to have these very bright colours, immaculate mm. polished uh, engines. And I, I guess, in fact, that <coughs> I mean, supposing you're seventy years old now, you're born in nineteen. Well, my, my goddaughter born in 1952. Mm. You'll have steam trains almost you, well until you're sixteen if you live in the northwest of England, but. Mm. It's unlikely that you'll often see a very clean steam train in the 50s or, or um, 60s. I'm told that as a child, <coughs> I was mad keen on the A4 Pacifics when I was about two or three years old. Mm -hmm. And we were living in London. I'd, I'd insist on being taken to Hadley Wood, just outside mm -hmm. London, on the King's Cross line, where it goes out in the countryside, mm -hmm. to see them. And apparently at the age of three, I sketched Sir Nigel Gresley itself, the engine, because oh, I had names his engines. Now, yeah. I'd love to say I've got the picture that I drew at the age of three, but um, oh, wow. I'm afraid I haven't. And I can't <laughs> lose the worst bit. <coughs> Some people have got very good memories of their childhood. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no memory yeah. whatsoever. I think I'm, I'm the same. <laughs> but, 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 same. Some of, but, but some of the earliest memories that I have we're watching Thomas the Tank Engine, like at my granny and granddad's house, or my grand and papa's, or my mum and dad's, like, and just feeling so safe, so secure, and so loved, like just watching this program. Like, and even now, at the at my age of thirty five, if I've, well, because I suffer from mental health issues as well, and my best antidepressant is putting on a classic era Thomas, like, and it always puts that smile back on my face. It's absolutely fantastic. Like, but in, uh, the steam yeah. trains in Scotland probably lasted until about 1967, I'm guessing. Roughly when about I was the, very about young, that time, yes. I, I remember staying as a child in a hotel right underneath the fourth bridge in a, a village called Queen's Ferry, just outside mm. Edinburgh. So this would have been yeah. 1967. Mm. And I was delighted by the fact that our bedroom window, I could actually look out of the window and see engines going up towards the, you know, that massive bridge that you couldn't miss yeah. when you came out of the hotel. It was the Hawes Inn we were staying. But what I also, but A, all I can remember seeing was a, well, they're called brush type fours, a, a green class 47 going across and DMUs. And secondly, I, I've never forgotten this. The world was very different then, particularly in Scotland. We were not allowed as children, my sister and I, in the dining room. So the waiters, brought the meals up to us in our bedroom. And I was very impressed by the fact that the waiters could speak English, French, and German, uh, obviously English. And um, uh, you, uh, it's, when I think of Scotland, I, I think of staying in nice hotels as a child. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father always loved Scotland, though he was mm -hmm. Welsh. But yeah. um, I, I do remember once going on a magnificent railway ride. I think it was from Inverness, Mm -hmm. to Golsby on that line that goes up the um, northwest, northeast coast. Of, yeah. Because we were staying in a place called Golsby, mm -hmm. a little village, um, actually it's north of Inverness. Uh, it must have, we must have probably gone on Thurso. And uh, this train almost went through people's back gardens. And it really was, again, Dolby-esque. The last, mm -hmm. th this would have been 1980, a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. the last throwback to community-involved railways where... Mm -hmm. The, the train would rumble past people's houses and they'd recognise the driver and stuff like that. And mm. uh, it was fascinating, just the engine pulling up the hill and then going up, back down the other side. And I guess the railways are still there, but I would mm. guess so it's equally it's all very uh, yep. efficient well and rather dull, multiple uh, <laughs> unit trains. It has to be said that going on a train nowadays is nothing like as much fun as it used to be, although it is quicker. <clears throat> mm. It's quicker, but not always better. But at the same time, uh, the time's starting to run out. I'll need to go and pick up my kids from nursery. But Nick, you're an absolute gentleman. I am so pr so proud to have been able to talk to you, to relive what Thank this, you. What, this work mm. with you. But, um, everybody, please, www.quantafilms.co.uk or .com. 
please order yourself a copy of the Thomas the Tank Engine Man documentary. What tell what even putting the message, tell them Andrew sent you, tell them the ginger engine sent you. What you might get a mug. Who knows? The mugs are there too. They're brilliant. I've got I'm getting one. I have to get one. What Nick, you have been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yep, it's been an absolute honor, my friend. What um what we definitely need to do this again. What I'm just so in awe of, of your tales and well I, I could talk all day about railways and Thomas and Wilbert. So mm -hmm. let's give it another go when you next need me. Okay. Definitely definitely. Like damn me having to go and pick up my kids. <laughs> I'm sure you do, yes. Children yeah. come first. As okay. Robert himself would have agreed. Definitely. Right, so then, right. thanks very much. Bye. Yes, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.